What we're going to be looking at here are diluted earnings per share here for stock options and we're going to be using the treasury stock method here to determine the stock options that would be included in the earnings per share calculation. Now for example here Corporation A's diluted earnings per share is based on these facts here. Now we have net income here for the year here 20x2 of $80,000 and only potentially dilutive security that's outstanding here were 1,000 stock options each exercisable for one share here of common stock and the uh, stock option is $16 per share here. So what uh, the um, holder of the stock option could do is they could buy one share here, common stock, for $16. Now we're going to be looking at two cases here where these options were issued here during the year 20X1. That's the case here where the uh, all these stock options are going to be sitting out here for the entire year here, 20X2, which we're going to be determining the diluted earnings per share on. And then uh, case two here, this is where the options were issued here during the year 20x2 and they were issued here on 10.1x2 and so they're going to only be sta outstanding here three months during the year here 20x2. Now uh, three here the common stock outstanding during 20x2 this is average number of shares here common stock outstanding 10,000 shares and the average market price here for common stock during the year 20x2 was $40 per share. So the first thing we have to do here is we have to determine a dilu a delusion versus anti-delusion of the earnings per share. Now this is where the company includes the diluted earnings per share here for stock options and warrants outstanding whether or not they're presently exercisable unless they are anti-dilutive and that then they're not going to be included in the uh, diluted earnings per share. So here's the case here. We're going to have our stock options and warrants outstanding here and we have case uh, A here where you're going to have the diluted earnings per share here and then case B where they have anti anti-diluted earnings per share here. So for our diluted earnings per share, this is the case where the excise price on those options is less than the market price of the uh, common stock here. Now this is where you're going to have a dilu uh, dilution is going to increase the common stock because these uh, it's assumed that these uh, options are going to be exercised here and that's going to mean that there's going to be more common stock issued here. And by issuing more common stock that's going to reduce the earnings per share here. Now this is when when you have the case here where the excise price is less than the market price, this is where we're going to use that treasury stock method to determine what the um, what these options are are equivalent to in common stock. And uh, again, in the case here where you have the dilute, diluted earnings per share here and where the excise price is less than the market price, then that would be included in reporting the diluted earnings per share. Okay, that would be in your financial statements. Now the other case here is where you have an anti-diluted earnings per share. That's where the excise price here, those uh, options are greater than the market price of the stock. That would be considered anti-dilution and that reduces the common stock. That's only if you carry it through with the calculations that we use, but uh, th uh, since it, that would be increasing the earnings per share here if you have less common stock outstanding, and if that's the case then you do not include it in diluted earnings per share as reported in your financial statement. So that's the case here where uh, we wouldn't be including uh, those stock options in the uh, diluted or an, uh, diluted earnings per share because they would be reducing diluted earnings per share. So do not include them. Okay, so now let's go and we're going to be using this treasury stock method here to determine the uh, these how these stock options affect the common stock outstanding here. Okay. Okay, so here's a, we're going to first go through the logic here, and we're going to be using this treasury stock method. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get down to determine the total common stock that's outstanding plus the potential common stock that would be issued here based on our uh, stock options that we have. So, okay, now when you uh, use this treasury stock method, that assumes that the options are exercised at the beginning of the year here or the date of issue if it's later than the beginning of the year. And we're going to be look at, looking at both cases here. So uh, going through this treasury stock method to hear the, the logic of it and then we'll just go through the equations here to determine what we're, what we're de 
determining here is a potential common stock, uh, common stock that would be issued here for these options. So first we start with a, a number of option shares. Well, we had a thousand options here. Each one can buy one share of common stock. So that would represent a thousand shares here or a thousand shares here of stock or uh, options here. So now we have to look at the option price here per share. Well, we know that's $16. We're given that. So the proceeds on the exercise of the options, say all the options were exercised. So we get $16 here times those thousand uh, options here. That would recommend uh, equate to $16,000. Now we have to compare that to the average market price here, common stock that we were given here of $40 per share. So you can see right here, our market price here for common stock of $40 is greater than the option price here, $16. Okay, so now we move down here and this is where this treasury stock comes in. So the treasury stock that could be repurchased with the proceeds here, the $16,000 proceeds here for the stock option. So there we simply take the, um, uh, price per share here common stock $40 per share divided into the proceeds of $16,000 here so we're going to come up with uh, 400 uh, shares here of common stock that could be repurchased here based on the proceeds we received. Now what we have to do is uh, compare the excess of the option shares over the treasury shares that were repurchased here so our option shares here were 1,000 shares here. Now what we could repurchase was 400 shares here. So the difference gives us uh, six of uh, 1,000 less 400 here gives us 600 shares here. Those are what they call the incremental shares here that we'd be uh, that these options represent. Since we could only buy back 400 shares with the proceeds and we have a total of a thousand shares of options or common stock sitting here. So what we would do here to determine the average, well we have to then look at the average common stock that's outstanding and we had 10,000 shares. So adding that to our ex excess here of options that would be incremental shares here of 600, we're going to come up with our total common stock plus the potential common stock here of 10,600 shares. Uh, adding in those incremental shares here to the average common stock outstanding. Now we had our net income here for the year here at $80,000. Now our earnings per share is simply taking these total, uh, our total common stock here plus those incremental shares here and divide it into 80,000 come up with an earnings per share here of $7.55. Now let's go and let's look at how we do this through our formulas here. So here, this is where we have to do, just through our formula, we're doing the number of shares here, those incremental shares that we're talking about here. So this is the case here where you take your market price here of the um, com average market price, your common stock, and subtract or compare that to the option price or subtract your option price from that market price here and divide it by the market price here. And then take that times the number of options that are involved. So then that equals the number of incremental shares that would be increasing based on these options. So just looking at our formula or here we $40 market price minus the $16 option price divided again by the $40 market price here times those thousand options or shares that it represents. So that amount here would equal 600, the 600 incremental shares that we calculated up above here. So this, use this formula here, then you don't have to go through all the logic from what we, what we did here. So that's the formula I use here. So this 600 here represent, represents the option issued for the entire year here X2. So that was our first case. Now to determine our diluted earnings here per share, this all we do is we take our net income here for the year and divide it by the average common stock that was sitting out here, number of shares, plus those potential shares here. Those potential shares here were those 600 incremental shares that we calculated based on those options. So that was going to equal our diluted earnings per share here. So our net income, 80,000 here divided by the 10,000 shares that were outstanding plus those 600 incremental shares is going to give us a diluted earnings per share here of $7.55 just as we calculated up above here. But in this case, just use this formula here that you're given here when you have to determine your diluted earnings per share here. Market price minus the option price divided by the market price times the number of options that would are represented here that equals your number of shares or your incremental shares. Okay, so now let's go down and let's look at the case here where those options 
instructions were issued here on 10.1 x2. So what we have to do is this is going to be based on the fact that these options are outstanding only here for three months. 10.1 through 12.31 year x2 and that's what we're determining our earnings per or our diluted earnings per share on. So very simple here. All we do is we take again our net income here for the year here of 80,000 and divide it by the 10,000 shares average shares that are outstanding plus we add in that incremental number of shares here. So that was based on how you come up with the incremental number of shares here when you got a fraction of the year that these options were outstanding. Again, just use your general equation here. $40 market price uh, per common stock minus the different uh, the $16 option price here divided by the $40 market price times the with number of options that are represented here as common stock times the fraction of the year that they're outstanding. So in this case we only had three months remaining in the year here so that fractional amount were three twelfths of a year times our, our quantities here that's going to give us the rep option what the incremental shares or those potential shares of common stock that are represented here at 150. So again, for the par part of a year here, we take our just our net income, those average shares that are common stock were outstanding plus the potential shares here uh, based on that fraction of the year here, divide that out and you're going to get $7.88 per share here for the diluted earnings per share here based on that fraction of year that the options are outstanding. Now if we just go and compare that to our basic earnings per share, in the case of the basic earnings per share you just take your net income here and divide it, 80,000 here, divide it by the um, 10,000 shares of common stock that was outstanding. That's the case here where you didn't include any of those options or potential uh, shares of common stock that would be through those options here. And you're going to get up your basic earnings per share here at $8 per share. So you can see here uh, how our diluted earnings per share here are less than our basic earnings per share here. For the case where those options were outstanding for the entire year here, it was $7.55 per share versus for the partial year here that those options were outstanding here at $7.88 per share. Okay, so that takes care of our discussion here and let's just go back to it one more time here. Our discussion here uh, when we're trying to determine the equivalent number of shares here that these options represent here and just remember this is what you're going to be using here. You, the two things you have to be concerned with. First for the you have to determine the incremental number of shares that are outstanding and that has to be based on the fact that your market price here is greater than your option price. So market price less your option price divided by your market price here on a per share basis here times the number of options that are represented for the period here and then that equals your number of shares or your incremental shares here that you'd have to be and those are the potential shares here that you have to add to your uh, numerator here when you're determining your diluted earnings per share and then again for the diluted earnings per share just remember net income here plus the shares uh, average number of shares of the common stock that are outstanding here plus those potential shares here that are represented by those um, options or those stock options. Okay, so that concludes our discussion here on our diluted earnings per share here based on those stock options. And again, we use the treasury stock method here to determine the number of potential shares represented by the stock options.